Hey, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Myron Jellison. I'm the youth pastor here at the church, and I'm excited about this Life Hack series. Not only because we get to learn fun, cool things like that about how we can hack our life, but we're going to look at our spiritual life and how we can hack that so we have the best possible spiritual life that we could imagine. So Life Hack is an awesome series that you, if you weren't here last week, get caught up. And we're going to look at some things that will make our spiritual life easier and more simple. And last week, Chris Figueroa, our lead pastor, he talked about the ultimate life hack. And he, and he told us what the ultimate, the most incredible life hack was, and that was the Word of God. And, and, and the story that he used, or the account that he used, was after Moses died, G, uh, uh, Joshua was going to be in charge of leading the people into the promised land. And Joshua was like, all right, let's do this. Let's go. What are you going to give me? What are you going to do for me? And God's like, hold on. You don't have a staff that will turn into a snake and back into a staff. You don't have those miraculous powers. You have something far greater. You have the Word of God, the five, first five First five books of the Bible that Moses wrote, the books of the Bible, and the Word of God is what you have, and, and you'll be way more successful using that than having any miraculous powers. You know, and, and God told Joshua, well, be strong, be courageous, and read that Word, consume it, and don't simply consume it, meditate on it, and live it out. Put it into practice. And that's exactly what I want to learn to or look at, look at today and talk about today is how do we take the most incredible, the ultimate life hack that God's given us, his word, and how do we put it to work? How do we actually put it into practice? Now, I think we all have this common understanding that the word of God is like kind of a life textbook. It's kind of like the game plan or the playbook. And you've probably seen this on the internet or, or a meme. I've even seen it on a billboard around the area. Bible is an acronym, basic instructions before leaving earth. I mean, we kind of get that, that it's kind of like this playbook. It's this life textbook. It's the, uh, it's the word of God that we can use and to, to guide us in how we are to live our life. But there's this clutter. There's this stuff that, that gets in the way of what normally should be simple in the word of God, but we overdo it and we clutter it up. Now, you don't have to be a huge Bible expert, a big Bible scholar, a theologian, or professionally, academically trained. You don't, have to, you don't have to be that to be able to understand the Word of God. And it's put like this. The kingdom of God is not for the intellectuals with big brains and big understandings. It's not. The kingdom of God is that of such a child can understand. So what was intended to be so simple, we've overdone it and we've overcomplicated things and we've cluttered the Word of God. And, 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 and what, what was meant to be so simple is just the obedience of, of following the word of God. We've cut, cluttered it with other things such as we've misinterpreted what the scriptures are actually saying. We've just, we've just flat out missed the, missed the mark and we've misinterpreted it. Or maybe it's because there's this slow drift that kind of happens with things over time. You know this if you've been around and involved in some for a while. There's kind of this shift in the culture and the society and there's all these other influences that kind of shift uh, the culture and the nature the nature of something over time. And you see, we started with the simplicity of the message of Jesus Christ. And that is what we call the gospel. We started with that. And then over the years, we've added layer and layer and layer and layer on top of that. And it's called clutter. And our culture and our society has thrown in so much other things that causes us to be clouded in that. You see, but what I want to do today is before we get to that, though, I, I want us to, 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 to understand why the Bible is so important. We're going to talk about that clutter. We're going to talk about the what and kind of the things that cloud and get in the way of our simple obedience of just following what God gave us. And we're going to look at first the two reasons why the Bible is so important. The two reasons why we believe the Bible is the ultimate life hack. But it's only the ultimate life hack if you do what it says if you actually do what it says and what we'll discover is hopefully the title of this message is called what the hack so when you take the bible and actually apply it to your life and do it you'll step back and go what the heck it works it works so what the hack and we're going to look at the two reasons why this is the most powerful most incredible life hack ever the word of god number one if you got notes in your program you want to write this down feel free number one <clears throat> lays out the path of wisdom and godliness it lays it out. It lays out the path for wisdom and godliness. If you start to read it and apply it to your life and start to do what it says, you will begin to discover and, and, and understand the right way to live and the right path you should take. It literally speaks. The Bible literally speaks to every single life situation you and I will encounter. 
It may not do it explicitly with direct commands about my situation. When it doesn't do that, it does that sometimes, but when it doesn't do that, it will speak to us implicitly by a teaching or a principle that lays out that we can apply to every single situation in our life. There's a principle for everything in there. Now, it's not going to tell you what parking space you should park in. It's not going to do that. Some of you are like, dang, I wish it would. But it will tell you how to react and treat the person who rips you off of that parking spot up front at Walmart. I've seen this happen. Not in my own car, I promise. It was another person's car. But it's not going to tell you, it's not going to directly tell you how you are to handle the pipe and drape issue in the back of the auditorium that's blocking your seat that you want to sit in, but it will absolutely tell us how we are to view and interact with the person who does try to go in the opposition of what we're asking them to do. It's not going to tell you what job you should or should not take, but it may give you some guiding principles and guidelines of what job you should pursue. And it will absolutely command us and instruct us and teach us how we are to operate inside of that job once we get that job. It literally speaks to every situation explicitly and implicitly. Direct commands and and, and commandments and teachings or underlying principles and values in which the Bible speaks to us. In the book of Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6 says this, it's so good. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So when your understanding says this, when, you, when you've begun to kind of go in this direction, you're like, yeah, this is what makes sense. This is what feels good. This is, this is where my life is headed. And, and you neglect to trust in the Lord, ooh, your path's going to be bumpy. But when you trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in the moment of that decision of whatever circumstance you're, you're going through, it says that, and he will make your path straight. If you deny your own desires and your own will and your own understanding and trust in God and use the word of God as the ultimate life hack and do what it says, your path will be straight. We've all done this, right? Where we wanted to get somewhere to a destination, but we went the hard way. You took the windy road, you went up and down the hills and valleys. You, you eventually got to where you wanted to go, but you didn't do it in the most efficient way. Wait, we've done this physically, we've done this geographically, and we've done this relationally. And here's what I mean. It, it, you have met someone or, or you're like, yeah, I, I want to get to this place with this person, either as a spouse or as a friend, as a coworker. I have an expectation. This is where I want to get to with that person relationally. But because of some of the dumb decisions that I made, uh-oh, I started the windy path. I started the ups and downs. If I would have just trusted God, trusted the Lord and not my own understanding, the, 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 the path to that destination in which I sought out would have been much neater, cleaner, and straighter. So that's the most important reason, I think, why the Bible is so important and is the ultimate life hack because it lays out the path of wisdom and godliness. The second reason is it's impossible to have a good relationship with God if we ignore the Bible. But that's it for a moment. It is impossible for you. You cannot have a good relationship with God, your heavenly father, if you ignore his word. Now, you might think, you might think you have a good relationship with him. But it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what he thinks of it. Now, again, you don't have to be a scholar, a theologian, a person with big intellect and understanding of the Bible to do this. Because at the core of it all, at the core of it all is our obedience. And here's the thing about obedience. You can't be obedient if you don't know the boundaries and expectations, right? Like you you don't know what you're obeying if you don't know the thing that you are to obey. And the word of God lays it all out for us. It is a, a, a life textbook of instructions and commandments explicitly and implicitly that if we would just follow them, our path could be straight. So if we ignore the Bible and we want nothing to do with it, And we kind of use it as this cosmic consultant rather than the word of God. You cannot have a good relationship with your heavenly father. And what happens most of the time, I think, in our life is we treat our relationship with God subjectively around our emotions. We treat him, we treat our relationship with him based on how we feel. And we may say things like this, like, I just feel far from him. I'm not, really, I'm not really into this whole church thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not really into this worship thing. I don't know. I just feel off. I, I feel disconnected. I feel stagnant, right? We probably say things like this, like I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't feel like doing it. Now that is how we judge our relationship with God most times, but that's not how he judges it. 
He doesn't judge it based around our emotions or how we feel, whether or not we want to follow him or not follow him or whether or not we're super pumped up and enthusiastic and excited about what he's doing or if we're not super pumped up, excited, and enthusiastic about what he's doing. He judges it through one lens, and it's this, through our simple obedience. If we will just do what the word of God says. The author of 1 John chapter 2 says this, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. If you're a Christ follower and you're claim, claiming to know him, then you got to do it by keeping his commandments. Because the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. The one who says, oh yeah, I got the coffee mug with the scriptures. Oh yeah, I got the U version Bible app that already pre-makes my social media posts for Instagram and I just upload that thing every single day. You know, I got it going on. I got the bumper sticker. I got the whole thing going on. But they do not follow what Jesus has taught us and laid out in the word of God. Then you are a liar. And the word used in the original text means a self-deceiving liar. You're just fooling yourself. Jesus said this himself. In uh, John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And here's, a, here, here, here's what I have come to discover is, is the most important thing is how we love God and how we love others. And the expression of our love is in our obedience. If we love him, if you love me, Jesus says, you will follow, you will keep my commandments. And then there's this great commission. If you've ever been around in church and you've heard of the great commission, great. If you've never been around in church and don't know what the great commission is, look it up in the index of your Bible or just Google it. You can find out what the great commission is. And if you've been around the vineyard, you know that our mission statement here at the church comes from the great commission. And let me just summarize it for you real quick. It goes like this. Go and make disciples. Go everywhere. Go into all nations and make disciples, which literally just means make make them a Jesus follower. Teach them to find Jesus and then teach them to follow Jesus. You'll baptize them. You'll do all this stuff and you are not finished. The Great Commission says you are not finished until you have taught them to obey everything I have commanded you. Because from beginning to end, top to bottom, what our relationship means to God is not what we probably think it is most of the time. It is about our obedience. And this is why the scriptures This is why the Bible, the Word of God, is so vital in us, in our daily life, with our decisions, and also so vital and important to how we relate and engage with, in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Two most important reasons. Now, what are the things that clutter it? What are the things that cloud it? What are the things that get in the way that make it difficult for us to just, just to dive into this simple obedience? And I want to, I want to talk about six things that sabotage simple obedience. And if you have a program and you're a note taker, great. If you're not a note taker, take that program and those six things are listed that you can be reminded of. If you want to follow along, you can. Six things that sabotage our simple obedience. Now, my assumption is that some of these, one or two will probably pop out at you and really hit you home and stick with you. I hope not all six. If so, we have some lovely people in the back of the auditorium who'd love to pray with you and help you and we're there for you. But I'm assuming that at least one, maybe a couple, will really stick out and hit home with you. And the first one is so incredibly common in our culture, in our society today. And 99.999% of the time, it's going to lead to a stupid, dumb decision that you're probably going to regret. And number one says this, letting our conscience be our guide. Letting our conscience be our guide. Thinking like, oh, I can just trust my instincts. I can just go with my gut on this one. I run it through the filter of, I got peace about it. It's good. You know, that's what my, it's it's a crazy idea, but it's not crazy to our world and our culture because that's what they're saying. Does it feel good in the moment? You know, is it going to benefit numero uno? Do you feel peace about it? Then yeah, absolutely. Just go for it. And we think that our conscience is something God gave us to understand his standard. We think our conscience is something God gave us to interpret his moral code, his rights, and his wrongs. Okay, but there are some basic, let me just clarify, there are some basic moral truths that God has written on every single heart of every single human being. And we know this, you'll agree. We do not like people lying to us. It's a universal moral truth. We don't like liars. And then we don't like people stealing from us either. 
So those are like those basic moral truths that God's written on every single one of our hearts. But in this culture, when we say, just go with your conscience, do you have peace about it? Is when it can get us into trouble. God did not give us a conscience to understand his standard. God gave us a conscience to understand and know if we are breaking our own standard. I have an example that may help clear this up if you don't agree with me or believe me. Here it is. Your conscience is like a thermostat, okay, not a thermometer. Now, if you have one of those fancy uh, smartphones that has like the ability to control your your, uh, HVAC system at your house, okay, if you don't, you can visualize this with me because I don't have one. But I can look at my phone and go, okay, it tells me the reading of my house temperature, but it doesn't tell me if it's hot or cold. I get to determine whether or not the house is too hot or too cold based on the number that I see, right? And there's this woman that lives in my house, has a completely different definition of what comfortable is when it comes to temperature. I wish I had one of those dual thermostat cars that like I had my side, she has her side, I could be comfortable. She's like frying eggs over here on the vents. I mean, it's unbelievable that 68 is so different to her than it is to me. 72 for you or whatever your number is, every single person interprets that number a little bit different. And the thermometer, so the thermostat is what we do or use to get it to where we want it or to where we are comfortable. But the thermometer tells me exactly what it is. The word of God is a thermometer. Tells me exactly what it is, the right, the wrong, what's moral, what's immoral. And then my conscience is that thermostat that will take the thermometer and say, I'm just going to adjust this a little bit to get it to where I want it. I'm going to change it to get it to where I feel comfortable. And as a Jesus follower, we're, we're told that our mind has been renewed by his spirit And what that means is that it's renewed and now we can align our mind, we can align our conscience with the word of God. And we can start to think and be able to trust our conscience because it's aligned with the word of God. But no matter how long you've been following Jesus, you know that there's a tendency for that to pop right out of alignment, right? Because at our very nature, at our very core of humanity, we are out of alignment of God's Word, but we have to fight every single day to renew our mind, to stay in line with our conscience and our mind of what God is saying in his word. Now, when we say, I have peace about it, there is no guarantee that God has peace about it as well. Apostle Paul, you know who he is. He was a super, super, uh, you know, he was like a superstar in the Christian realm. I mean, he wrote pretty much most of the New Testament. He would be considered at the top of the spiritual food chain. And Paul said something so profound in 1 Corinthians about his own conscience. And I love this. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 4.4. Paul says, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. Another translation says, My conscience is clear, but that does not prove me right. So he's thinking straight. He probably has peace about it. He probably has a good understanding and moral philosophy. And he's the top of the spiritual food chain. He's got, he feels good. It feels good to him. He's got peace about it. It doesn't prove him right because he says, it is the Lord who judges me. Paul, the superstar that he was writing most of the New Testament, if he had to check himself, even though his conscience was clear and he had peace about it, he felt good about it. If he still had to check with the Lord, yes, we have to check with the Lord because some of the biggest mistakes, dumbest decisions, and the worst regrets we have in life are because we trusted our conscience in the moment. It was out of alignment with the word of God. We felt good and we had peace about it. But that's the clutter that can get in the way of our simple obedience. Moving on to number two. It's actually number four in your program. I reworked these after we printed. I'm sorry. So you can just follow along. Number four in your program, number two here. Failing to check in with God because the decision seems obvious. This stems right off of the conscience, right? God gives us so much freedom. He says, you know, you can live where you want. You can have whatever job you want. You can pursue all these things. You have so much freedom. You can choose who you marry as long as they're a Christian. He gave us a little bit of a guideline there, but we have so much freedom in this life. And what will happen is when the decision seems so obvious with our freedom of like, oh, yeah, I can just do that, it can turn around and bite us. And, 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 here's, and here's what I know. Satan is the greatest deceiver of them all, the absolute greatest deceiver of them all. And what he'll do is if you let your conscience be your guide long enough and the decision just seems so obvious over and over and over again, that's Satan trying to deceive you and say, no, you got this. You don't need to check in with God. You, don't, you, you just go with it. Go with your gut, man. Go with your conscience. Go what feels good. 
And I've learned pretty quickly in my Jesus following years to not trust my conscience. Because even when the decision seems so obvious, sometimes I won't even stop to inquire what the Lord has to say about it. I'll just blow right through it and do whatever feels good in the moment. But here, I want to tell you a story of a time when I got it right. So failing to check in with God when the decision seems obvious is the clutter. I did the opposite. I did it right, and I'm so glad that I did, and my life has never been the same since. And here's what happened. I'm going to finish up my college career. I'm going to graduate. Woohoo! get to be an adult. What does that mean? I don't know. What the heck? i got to be an adult now? And I'm like, okay, so what am I going to do with my life? What's my next step in my life? And I knew that uh, I wanted to be a baseball coach. That was my dream and that was my passion. And everything I did in life leading up to this point was to pursue the dream of being a big time division one college baseball coach. And I was making relationships and I was earning my, you know, resume and I was getting there. I was getting there. And I walk out of the AD's office at a, a university with the GA position booked. Like, okay, great. You'll be our GA. If you don't know what GA is, you'll get your master's degree paid for free and you'll be on, you'll be a coach. You'll be a full-time coach for the university. It's like, awesome. This is amazing. Thank you so much. I leave his office. 20 minutes later, I get a call from another college coach that says, hey, man, we want to give you the GA position at our, our university and uh, let me know. I was like, great. It's fantastic. I was like, God, thank you. Two amazing options in the same day that I just got to figure out which program's better, which one's going to benefit me, which one, feel, which one do I feel good about, which one do I feel peace about, and I'll just go with it. The decision's obvious. Let me pray about it. Okay, God, thank you so much. Amen. All right, don't want to pray too long. You might change my mind. <laughs> right? And then a little while later, no more than like 10 minutes, I get a phone call from Chris Figueredo from the Vineyard Church, and he says, hey, Myron, God's telling me to offer you a position here full-time on the ministry team. I said, What? Are you crazy? So in that moment, I was getting wise counsel from people, and they said, hey, you need to take some time and pray about this. You need to see what God has to say about this. And I'm so glad I had somebody in my corner telling me to do this. Because what I did is I said, I called the coaches back. I said, hey, I need two weeks. They said, great, Myron, fine. Take two weeks. Just let us know. In that two-week period, I'm praying, God, what do you want me to do? What decision do you want me to make? Where's my life going? Show me. Reveal it to me. And here was his answer. Okay, good talk. So the next day, I'm like, I'm like, God, what do you want me to do? Which one do you want me to take? Again, his answer. Cool, good talk, great. For two weeks, two weeks, I kept praying, I kept seeking, I kept asking. And eventually what I came to know is that God had a different plan than I had for my life. And he revealed to me, he's like, he's like Myron, he's like, are you going to serve a game? Are you going to serve an athletic competition? Or are you going to serve me? And in that moment, I realized that he was calling me, he was, he was showing me and revealing to me that, yes, I want you to be a part of the ministry team, the staff here at the Vineyard Church. And I was obedient. I said, yeah, let's do it. Sure. I'm in. I'll, I'll follow you in your promptings and your leadings. And little did I know now that he was protecting me from that lifestyle. Because that lifestyle was not the lifestyle I wanted for me. Traveling, hotels, never home, no family time. It literally runs your entire life. He protected me from them. He said, no, I got something way better for you in store. And I'm glad that I had somebody in my corner telling me to do that, to check in with God, even when the decision seems so obvious. And I'm here today to tell you the exact same thing. Even when it seems obvious, check in. Because simple obedience can be messed up when we say, I don't need God on this one. Next one. Asking for more proof when God has already spoken clearly. Asking for more proof, this will clutter it up because instead of jumping when God says jump and asking him how high on the way up, we step back and go, how does, how does my conscience feel about this? How, how, is this actually relevant to me? So God, if you're really telling me to do this, would you do some miraculous thing like a sign that would just really affirm it to me that this is what I need to do? No, don't do that. He's already spoken so clearly in your life and he's just asking us to respond with our love and our love is simple obedience to what he has already spoken. Spoken. So do not say, God, if I'm supposed to marry that woman, make her wear a red dress tomorrow. No, that's not gonna benefit <laughs> anybody. Do not, do not do that. Don't ask for more proof or do not try to, to get God to, to give you a sign if it really does apply to you because he's already spoken so clearly either explicitly or implicitly by the word of God. And here's an example you'll understand. If you got kids, you'll get this. If you don't have kids, you'll still get it because kids' examples are great. A parent says to the kid, hey, it is time to go to bed. Pretty clear. It's time to go to bed. The kid goes, are you talking to me? <laughs> parent says, yes, you, it is time to go to bed. And the kid's like, all right, 
if you're talking to me, just do a backflip real quick. Right? I mean, that's fair. And the parent's going to go, no, I'm not going to do a backflip because one, I can't. And number two, I already spoke. I already told you what I wanted you to do. And if you would love me, you would just obey my commandments. The next thing that will clutter us up is we sometimes confuse risk and faith. Oh, boy. Sometimes we confuse risk and faith. Sometimes we are lazy to get the facts, okay, to get a good understanding of what's going on, or we just flat out don't want to get the facts because we're like, I can kind of foresee where this is going. I don't want to even, I don't even want to go down that road. But, and then what we do is because we didn't get the facts, or we were lazy to get the facts, we just leap out and say, you know what, God, rescue me, save me. I didn't first think this through. I first didn't counsel the word of God and see what it had to say about the situation. I'm just calling it faith and leaping out and asking you to, to, to bend over backwards and save me and rescue me. But never once, never once did God say, go out on a limb and I'll rescue you. There's, the, there's, an, there's an example of a, a, a car. Like let's just, let's just use this story. You decide if it's true or not. There, there's a family that says, you know what? We're going to trust God. We're going to sell the house. We're going to move. Everyone packs in the car and we're gone. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're going to do. We're just trusting in faith that God's going to make it work. Well, guess what? You're an idiot. I mean, God never said do anything irrational like that without first thinking it through and gathering the facts and, 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 and listening to his word to show you what you are to do. He said you're, you'd be an idiot. Never go out on a limb and, and I'll rescue you is not a promise that he has in the Bible. Now, we can recognize and understand that there's nothing sinful about that adventure of packing up and going and as long as you know that you're packing up and going and you don't have any idea or any plan of what is going to happen. And Proverbs 19.3 says this, powerful stuff. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. People ruin their lives. They make dumb decisions because of their foolishness. They didn't collect the facts. They didn't consult the word of God. They just leaped out in faith and it was foolish and a risk. And then they turn around and say, God, how dare you not save me? How did you not come through for me and do this thing for me? He's like, well, I never, I never said. I never said for you to do that. So we cannot confuse risk and faith because faith is trusting, having enough trust to do what God has already said. Say that again. Faith is is trusting and knowing what God has already said and doing what he has already said. It's not a risk, it's not a leap to jump out and do something irrational. Now there's a story of Peter, okay? He's gonna walk on the water. If you've been around church, you heard it. If you haven't, buckle up, it's a great story. Now I'm gonna give you all a new perspective on this story of Peter walking on the water. Because they're in the boat, they're on the Sea of Galilee and a storm blows in. All the disciples, Peter's in there, and all of a sudden, they get scared, and they think they see a ghost walking on the water. Well, it was Jesus. He was walking on the water. And Peter looks out and says, Jesus, if that is you, call me out onto the water. And Jesus says, yeah, come. Come, step out of the boat and come on to the water. Now, the irrational thing to do for Peter would have been stay in the boat. The unfactual thing for Peter would have been to stay in the boat. Because here's the thing. Peter had experiential encounters with Jesus. And he had a relationship with Jesus. He's seen Jesus restore sight to the blind and, and the lame people could walk and the mute could speak and so many different miracles and so many more miracles Peter witnessed. So he knew that Jesus was God and that Jesus' word was good for it. So when he heard the phrase, come, yeah, it's not a risk at all because he knows that Jesus is good for it. So he steps out onto the water. And a lot of us think, wow, what faith he had. Yeah, what faith because he was just being obedient to what God had already spoken so clearly. We get into trouble when we value risk, but there is incredible value when we step out in faith and obedience. Now we get into trouble when we risk, when we risk it, when we, when we take the lazy way out, when we go against that good advice or that wise counsel and think, I'm just gonna do this out of faith and I'm gonna take the leap and hope God rescues me. Not a very smart thing to do. There's a, there's a teaching of Jesus' in the book of Luke. I'll summarize it for you. Jesus pretty much said this, and I'll summarize. It's not his words. It's, it's my interpretation. He says, only an idiot construction worker would start a project and not count the cost and see how much it would take to build this, this, this structure and get halfway through and realize I didn't have enough because everybody's going to laugh at him and say, what an idiot. You didn't, you didn't plan this very well. You didn't first count the cost. 
And then only a dumb general would only go to war without first seeing how many men they had and how many men I have and what kind of weaponry each, each, each uh, you know, army has. Only a dumb general would not count the cost before going to war. The same thing is true in our life. We need to count the cost. We need to collect the facts and seek the word of God to know and not take a risk, but take steps of faith because they are very different. They're not the same thing. Next one is asking God what to do without asking him when to do it. Asking God what to do without asking him when to do it. Because God's will, let's face it, God's will has a what and it also has a when. Now, the right thing at the wrong time, still not the right thing. There's timing involved in God's plan and purpose for each one of our lives. And sometimes the when is a lot sooner than we want. Yeah, like you just get pushed right into it and you feel overwhelmed, that's okay. And sometimes the when is a lot longer and it's hard and it's frustrating, waiting on God's timing to play out in our life. Now there's an account of Moses. There's a guy in the Old Testament, his name is Moses, and this is a real, a real account. And a lot of us know the story of Moses after the burning bush. Okay, that's kind of if you've been to Bible school or you've been in, in children's ministry or whatever, you've probably heard that story. But what I want to take a look at is Moses before he was that Moses after the burning bush. Moses knew, okay, his purpose. He knew his what? He knew that he was supposed to be the deliverer of his Jewish brethren from the, the, uh, the uh, captivity and the slavery of the Egyptians. Now Moses was drifting down a river and got adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So he was an adopted stepson to Pharaoh, okay? Now, so he was raised as an Egyptian inside the palace, all this luxury, but he still knew his purpose. God revealed to him and told him that you are going to be the deliverer of your brothers, the Jewish people in captivity of the Egyptians. He knew that, he knew that. And what happened one day is there was an Egyptian slave master beating one of the Jews. And he goes over and he's like, all right, I'm, I'm the deliverer, I'm the arbitrator, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to deliver my people from this oppression. And he goes up and he breaks him up, he ends up right hooking, straight up decking the Egyptian slave master, kills him. And just buries him in the sand. No big deal. Next day, two Jews are fighting. And he goes over and he's like, oh, I'm the arbitrator. I'm, I'm the deliverer. I'm going to separate these two and fix it and figure it out. It's my purpose. And he did. And the two Jewish guys look at him and say, what, are you going to punch us too? Are you going to give us the right hook and kill us as well? And Moses realized in that moment, uh-oh, he made a mistake. So he runs for the hills. And Moses spends 40 years in the wilderness And then God shows up to him in a burning bush. And that's where the story of Moses kind of picks up that a lot of us are probably familiar with. So Moses didn't have to spend 40 years in the wilderness for a certain reason. He simply had to do it because he didn't obey God's timing. He didn't obey God's when. You see, the burning bush showed up to Moses and said, hey, Moses, now you can go and be the deliverer. Go now and be the deliverer. Now it's my timing. You knew your what, but you jumped the gun on your when. Some of us jump our gun on the when, and some of us push it off so that it never happens. There's a story that hits home here at the vineyard. Matt Parsons, the bushy bearded worship guy up here. His wife, Becky, for four years was trying to get employment at this organization. For four years, she felt like this was her what? She felt like this is where she wanted to work, her dream job. And she was denied every single time for four years. But she never gave up. She kept praying. She kept being faithful and persistent, not begrudgingly, but out of faith, knowing that God was going to work. His timing was going to happen, and it was going to be perfect. And I'm here today to tell you and celebrate that her faith her persistence and her prayers allowed the timing of God to be so perfect in her life and she's now employed by that organization. Unbelievable. God's plan has a what and God's will has a when. So do not pray for the what or seek the what without acknowledging and seeking and praying about the when. The last thing that clutters up our, our, uh, our simple obedience to the word of God is this, one that I've never done, just so you know. Here it is, ignoring your spouse. Come on, never done that. If, you, if you're married, you know that if you do this, it's probably gonna lead to some pretty dumb and stupid decisions. And let me paint the picture of what marriage is. And if you go back to the very beginning, the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, this is what they say. The two become one. The two become one flesh. They come become one. And it's not a fight or a battle to see which one becomes. It is a brand new one. 
And God doesn't speak to half. Or the old one, he speaks to the brand new one equally. I've seen this in my marriage. I've seen this in other people's marriage. The more stubborn, the more bullheaded, the more easily angered, the one who's got the better words verbally can really manipulate and run over the other spouse when it comes to discerning and discovering God's will for the family. Now, God doesn't speak to the stronger, more dominant. He speaks to both equally. And here's what plays out. The what and the when are typically by each spouse. Like, okay, one spouse gets the what, and then the other one's like, I don't know, I'm a little hesitant about that, and that's the when. God's using them as the brakes to just let you not jump into it too quickly so his timing can play out perfectly in your life. And if you want a great marriage, learn to listen together. Now, Ephesians 5 is kind of a pinnacle description of what it looks like to, to be in a marriage. And it says this, submit to one another. It's equal. And it goes on to say, women or wives, submit to your husband. And then it says, husbands, how you mutually submit is like this, as Jesus loved the church and he was willing to lay down his life for her. So husbands, we are to lay down our life for our wives. And this isn't just a physical death. This is a death to some of our ideas, some of our dreams, some of our interests, because we have discovered and know that her interests and her needs are way more important than my own. Equal submission, serving each other and listening together to discover what God's will is for you because he speaks to the new one, not one of the old ones. That's what biblical oneness is all about. And if you want to discover it, listen together. Now, if you're not married, you're like, okay, well, that's good advice. Well, here, here, this is great advice because if you're not married, go ahead and pre-decide that this is the way you will conduct your marriage in the future if you're gonna get married. And also, this is what I say all the time, the best time to work on your marriage is before you're married. So go ahead and take this principle and apply it to your life so that you can have the best possible marriage and be able to discern God's will and his what and his when inside your marriage. Six things that sabotage our simple obedience. And following God's will, we've made it pretty hard. We've cluttered it, we've clouded it, we've made it very difficult. But here's the thing, that the early Christ followers, they weren't these super intellectuals that had big brains and, and professional training. But it swept, the movement of Jesus swept through the region and the nation and even the world because of one thing, their obedience to what God was saying. It's powerful. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obedience is quite simple. Even a child can follow it. It's not complex. And what we've made quite difficult is when God says jump, instead of us saying how high on the way up, we stop and think and go, how, do, how does my conscience feel about this? I don't need to listen to my spouse. Are you kidding me? You know, I, I'm just going to leap out in faith and, and trust that he'll catch me. And I'm going to take this risk that I've disguised as faith that ultimately will lead to a poor decision. I'm asking God, what, what do you want? What's my plan? What's my purpose? I keep asking him and I keep getting this answer, right? But ask him when the when. Ask him about the when because God's plan always has a what, always has a when. So all kinds of things can clutter and get in the way of the simplicity of the message of Jesus, the simplicity of simple obedience to what God has already spoken so clearly in the most incredible ultimate life hack, the Bible. And it's simply just the Bible if we don't do what it says. When we do what it says, it becomes the greatest, most incredible, ultimate life hack you and I have ever been given. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much that you just want us to follow in obedience. And God, that you gave us the word of God, the most powerful and incredible life hack. And if we would simply just obey it, if we would just uh, let it be the guiding guardrails and boundaries of how we are to conduct our life. And thank you that it speaks to me explicitly with commands and that it speaks to me implicitly with these principles so that I can navigate life and stay on the, stay on the short and steady straight path to wherever you're leading me. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.